Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of the Secret Garden series on I Heart Movies. My name is Jonathan North, and in this series, I'm planning to take a look at as many different versions of Francis Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden as possible. In this first episode, my cousin Sarah is joining me to talk about one of the very first screen adaptations of the story from 1949, starring Margaret O'Brien. Sarah chose this one to start with because it's the oldest one we could actually find a copy of. I believe there was an older version, however, sadly, like a lot of very old media, it seems to have been lost to time. So unless a copy of that turns up, this film from 1949 is currently the oldest adaptation of The Secret Garden in existence. Now as you might be able to tell when we got into this, we actually recorded this quite some time ago, probably not long after I'd actually started this podcast actually. Like with our Q&A video from a couple weeks ago, it just kept getting delayed, so much so that the way I do this show has somewhat changed, including the fact that I do my intro separately now. Back when I recorded this, we started out with one of our brief intros, but instead of cutting it now, I just left it in. I also left in a long rabbit trail about animals from Sarah, because back then those kind of things would get cut out of videos and saved for bloopers. Now everything is for the podcast, so everything gets left in. Okay, I think that about covers any housekeeping related to this episode, so let's get on to the very first episode of the Secret Garden series on iHeartMovies. Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of our brand new series looking at the Secret Garden. I think we're going to call it the Secret Garden series, but basically this is Wonderland Wednesday except the Secret Garden. <laughs> we wanted to talk about all the different versions out there that people have made of The Secret Garden. Because that's another book that we both really like. The one that we grew up reading, watching at least one version of. I don't know if you watched any others, but there was one version in particular that I loved, watched multiple times. And I kind of just wanted to see what else was out there. And I thought it would be fun to do another series sort of in the same vein as Wonderland Wednesday and just explore the things that people have made throughout the decades. I've read the book a few times and kind of grew up watching the one from the 90s. So it was interesting to try out something different. Disappointing. <laughs> interesting. Well, for this one, we were discussing which ones we wanted to talk about first. And Sarah told me that there was one from the 1940s that had the little girl from Meet Me in St. Louis. Is that the movie? Yeah, Margaret O'Brien. I wanted to go back as far as we could in the versions, and there was one that was even earlier from the teens or 20s, I believe, but it's believed to be lost. So this is as old as it's probably going to get unless there's something that somebody knows about. Feel free to throw it out there. We've had surprises with... Alice in Wonderland, that's for sure. Yeah. This one doesn't seem like it's been made as many times, mm -hmm. though it's just as worthy. Yeah. I think it's a really beautiful story. Very heartwarming. It's a very thought-provoking story. So was there any particular reason that the one from the 40s stood out to you as one that you wanted to watch first? Because it was the oldest. I guess I was, I was flexible, but you know me. The interest is tends to be with the really old stuff and yeah I was willing to start somewhere else but I was I also thought that Margaret O'Brien would be great mm -hmm. she's a great actress I've watched her in other movies where she did a wonderful job and they just wasted her in this film. I think that she did what they wanted her to do. It's just that whoever wrote the script mm -hmm. the made the wrong kind of deviations. The script was the biggest thing wrong with this movie. There were some weird choices in the movie. Very weird choices. The people who should have looked sickly didn't look sickly. So one of the things with The Secret Garden that you have to realize when you watch an adaptation is that when Mary was growing up in India, she was sickly and deprived of affection. So when she came to England, she had yellow skin, stringy hair. She was, if she wasn't emaciated, she was pretty close to it and a sour disposition. So that's where you get throughout the book all of these different comments about her 
looks, whether for better or worse. And as she becomes healthier, you have people commenting about how, you know, her appetite and how she's looking better. But in this film, when they're constantly making comments about her looks, it kind of throws you off. She doesn't look any different from beginning to end. She's a pretty girl all the way through. And then they also have the bizarre choices that they've made with Archibald Crane, where he is almost psychotically saying, I had hoped you would be beautiful. I mean, he sounds like a pedophile or something. Almost, yeah. And, like, why do you care whether she's beautiful or not? You're going to go off on vacation in Europe, you weirdo. And well, we hadn't read the book in ages before we watched well, this version. it had been a few years, maybe, for me. Maybe it's been longer than that. Little do I realize it's been, like, six or something. Well, the, the fact that people kept commenting on her looks just really stood out to us because yeah. we didn't realize, we hadn't remembered how sickly she was in the book. And Which, she does not look like that at all but, in the movie. But I had remembered that she gained health in yeah. the book and i and i went ahead and read the book afterwards so i'm more prepared for this and it's one of those things between watching two different versions and reading the book now i have to try and keep everything straight <laughs> archibald crane was just a really messed up dude in this version i feel like oh i don't even know where to start well, the, the main weird thing about him was that they kept making it seem like maybe he killed his wife. He really seemed on edge. And he, you know, as he's talking to her, he throws a glass behind him and breaks it. And he does that more. Doesn't he do that more than once mm -hmm. in the movie? And one of his, he says to her plainly that he drinks. I mean, they make him this really weird kind of disturbing character and speaking of weird and potentially disturbing mary's character is supposed to become sweeter and better throughout the story and every time you turn around mary's yelling and telling somebody that she hates them whether it really makes sense or not she kind of flip-flopped back and forth between who she was at the end and who she was at the beginning which like there was no consistency to her character and she had no real character development yeah, and she's supposed to be spirited, but get better throughout yeah. the book. So they muffed that. And Colin looks strapping. He looks so healthy. <laughs> Probably one of the better cast characters was Dickon. I you know, wasn't in love with him either. I love the character in the book, but he did all right. Mm -hmm. And... He was actually British. Uh, Martha was maybe... I feel like she was overdone. Yeah, she was not nearly as good as the one from the 90s. Yeah, the one from the 90s is literally British, and it was just more natural, and I feel like the Martha on this one was a little bit hammy. That actress is very good at being hammy if you were to watch her later on on a Disney movie. <laughs> Um, but I don't know how well she. She also didn't seem young enough to be the character that she was supposed to be playing. She seemed more like Dickens' yeah. mother than his sister. It would it would have worked. It, I mean, it worked, but Martha in the book, you get the impression that maybe she's like fourteen or something, not that old. Dickens himself is twelve, I think, ish. And, yeah. I haven't read the book in a long time. You read it sooner than well, I Well, the garden had been locked up for 10 years. So mm -hmm. Colin and Mary, 10 years old. And Dickon, I think, was 12. Just a little bit older. And in the book, Martha, you know that she's older than 12. But you get the impression that she's still just a girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um... They, it wasn't supposed to be funny, but when you get into the garden, there's an axe in the tree, and <laughs> there's tea set out on this table, and a fallen limb over top of the tree. Like, it looks like 
the over tree, top of the tea set. Oh yeah, there's a fallen limb over top of the chair. Yeah. Where she had supposedly been sitting. Now, if if your body was pinned under a tree limb, don't you think that they would move the tree limb to remove you? Mm-hmm. They, and and this whole thing of acting like it's potentially murder. It's so not in line with the book. They're actually more open in the book about what actually happened with Colin and his mother than probably in either of these versions. At some point, when you go into the garden, it switches to Technicolor. For most of the film, it's black and white. And that would be lovely if the film itself had been more magical up to that point. Yeah. But up till that point, it's just... When you get to that point, it, it it's almost like, well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it felt like something that could have been a really beautiful reveal. But it just seemed like a weird choice in a movie that was already weird. I did like the choice, but it seemed wasted on this particular version. And they kept him psychopathic <clears throat> too long. Mm, yeah. Archibald, that is. So when he's reunited with his son and he's happy again, it's like, you weird drunken psycho, all of a sudden you're happy because your son is walking, your very healthy looking son is walking. It, it, there's just, don't bother. <laughs> just don't bother. I mean, read the book. Read the book, if anything. Also, I'm going, okay, I have a couple of animal complaints. One is the robin is a huge part of this story. Like, the robin gets so much press in this book. Mm -hmm. There's even a portion of the book literally told from the robin and his mate's perspective. There's this whole chunk of a chapter where Hmm. it's like you're inside of their heads. Interesting. I don't remember that. Yeah, neither did I. It's awesome. And at first they're kind of disturbed by Colin trying to learn how to walk. And then, you know, it occurs to him that, you know, the fledglings are clumsy as well when they first come out. So maybe they're trying to help the boy to learn how to walk. And, you know, he shared this with his mate and they felt better. And just all of these different things. (laughs) You know, these these humans weren't very clever. They're not sure that they ever do learn to fly. But <laughs> it's adorable. But in this film, you have, like, this raven, like a raven that Dickon uh-huh. owns, and he's the one that leads the way to the garden, not the robin. Also, the fox looked like a domesticated fox like the color didn't even look true to a wild fox i don't know what where they dug this fox up i don't know if this is before the russian breeding program was it russian i don't know (laughs) but you know it just which would be far less of a complaint if i didn't have so many other complaints the robin is a bigger deal than the fox i should just be happy that they had a fox i suppose (laughs) We could have replaced it with a badger. Oh, that would have been so cool. <laughs> ah, English badgers are adorable. I guess I was thinking of a feral American badger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are like little memes about the English badger versus American badger. Like one of them wants to have you over to his cottage for tea and the other one's waiting in alley with a shiv or something. <laughs> <laughs> I never realized, it never dawned on me, when you actually look at them side by side, you have the little English badger like, oh, I'm so cute. And the other one's just like, go kill you. Don't mess with me. It's not a wolverine, it's a badger. The wolverines are their own thing. So yeah, ours are scarier. For some reason. And you guys get the adorable ones. I don't know. I guess that's okay. Whatever. 
whatever God decides needs to be placed where, but uh, now I'm just gonna, this is just gonna be an edited ramble about how much <laughs> I like English badgers and how creepy ours are, but I still want to see one of ours. I might as well ramble some more since this is gonna get edited. <laughs> well, it might end up in the podcast version. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, I love box. I love foxes and badgers. And robins. Well, that's true. But technically ours are much different than the English ones. Ours are in the thrush family. (laughs) And yours are in the I have no idea what family. (laughs) (laughs) But they're both great. Anyway, I don't know if I'm done complaining about this. Was there any, at any point, did his wife call him back? Was it just the doctor that told him to go back? How did, how did he end up going back to the garden, even? He was going to sell the house. Was the, I think maybe the doctor had convinced him that he needed to be a better parent. And so he had this whole thing of how he was going to take Colin away. Colin didn't really want to go. Mm-hmm. But he was going to go for the sake of his, the relationship with his father. And then you have this guy coming to look at the house and acting like he wishes that there was a ghost story or something to go with it. Meanwhile, this guy's, like, tortured because the house is a horrible place for him. And he, yeah, it works out. But that was totally not in the book. There was no talk of selling the house. But even though even though the way it worked out was kind of weird because the they figure out what's going on with the garden and then the guy the guy just decides oh i don't want to buy it anymore because everybody's happy like they had already done like the paperwork and everything and didn't the guy like rip up the contract probably it was just weird probably which the book in itself is more mystical than this version this Mm -hmm. is almost yeah this is just weird yeah Like I said, don't bother. And this is me talking about a film with Margaret O'Brien in it. So if they did not dispose of her talents properly, then shame on them. Anyway, that's about all I have to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess we can end this one here. We're going to be talking next week about... One that we liked far better. The one that we both grew up on from 1993. Yes. So I'm looking forward to talking about that one because I loved that movie. It's actually magical. Yes. It's not totally accurate to the book either, but... But the things that they did fit and don't feel forced and creepy. Well, maybe one part. But yes, the alterations fit far more with the actual book Mm -hmm. the spirit of the book so you get to look forward to that okay so we'll see you next week when we talk about the 1993 version bye bye (laughs) thanks again to sarah for joining me for this episode this series was partly her idea as we both grew up with this story and like we said in the episode we both grew up with one particular adaptation the 1993 version starring kate maberly as mary with maggie smith as mrs medlock I suppose it would have made the most sense to actually start with that one, as it was our favorite, but we were so sure we had a winner with the 1949 version that we decided to begin there instead. Oh well. Next time, we'll move on to the 1993 version, which is still to this day, in my opinion at least, the best version out there. Anyway, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time for another episode of the Secret Garden series on iHeartMovies.